tēnā kōta katoa, ko Margaret Stanley toku ingoa, toku ingoa uh, no Waipapa Tomataro Aho. Um, and I'm a stroller, but I'm also short here and too short to see over those. So I'm going to move over here. And I'm going to jump right into, I guess, uh, talking about, so skipping the trees. We've talked about trees, love trees, big trees, really, really important for biodiversity. But I'm going to skip straight into urban forests is more than just trees. And what we need is complex vegetation structure. So Robin's talked about layers. And I just love this uh, animation from uh, the Garden Bird Survey about uh, cakes and gardens being like cakes that need layers trying to get people to implement that in their own gardens. So um, we need this vegetation structure and we need uh, the layers. And um, sorry, for, I am born and bred in Dunedin, but this is going to be Auckland-centric. Apologies to South Islanders, I know what that's like. Um, but if you uh, go into an urban bush patch in Auckland, I see bush instead of forest, look at me go, um, then you will find that it's dominated by native birds. And that's because its vegetation is structurally complex. If you walk outside of that uh, bush patch, just into the resident suburbs around, um, unfortunately what you'll see is anything you can see in any other city, feral pigeons and sparrows. Uh, and, you know, it's um, mainly, you know, there's noise as a factor, human density as a factor, but actually one of the strongest predictors of when you'll start seeing native birds in that residential suburb CBD area is a shrub layer. So yes, trees, yes, less noise of traffic, but a shrub layer is really, really important. Um, so where's the shrub layer? And Robin's already talked about uh, these. We just love planting trees and then mowing around them. We love mowing um, and we also love putting tiles around. I think that's changing somewhat, although I did struggle. It's probably Robin's photo. Um, so we are starting to see these bigger pits and these layers and some uh, vegetation, but it's not um, something that's translating, I think, to the general public as much as perhaps councils are doing it uh, more. And the next thing we need to do is prioritise native plants, and I'm going to unashamedly say that because we have uh, huge endemism here. So 80, 90% of all of our organisms are found nowhere else in the world, so I've got a lot to do to protect them, but also connect people with them, and most people in New Zealand live in cities. So they've also got these unique um, evolutionary relationships, or whakapapa, so often what you'll get is, uh, particularly with plants, there'll be really strong herbivorous relationships, so you'll find something like this Astelia lace bug will only occur on Astelia. So we can protect more biodiversity and enhance it by having native plants and those relationships. So why do we default to exotics? <laughs> That's a question we ask a lot. Uh, I think it's often a knowledge deficit of do we actually have all the knowledge about ecosystem services that um, native plants provide. Sometimes we don't have basic biology or physiology. Um, we can grow exotics uh, cheaply and more easily. We've got knowledge from overseas on how to grow them and propagate them. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes there's a bit of a public preference uh, for exotics, and I think natives need some PR, um, because we have this dogma, often when you talk to people, that native plants are dull and don't have flowers, and people want flowers. Um, so I think we just need a bit of PR, actually. Um, <laughs> sorry, Tara, about the cherry tree here. Um, and thank you, Robin for the uh, email rant and the photo attached. But to me, this is just kind of disingenuously implying that cherry trees are native by calling it a tui tree. Um, and these now, uh, in a, this nursery, um, this came from. But of course now these are banned in Auckland because when I go out to forests, <laughs> shade tolerant large forests, intact forests, cherry seedlings coming up absolutely everywhere. And you know what? We have a tui tree. It's called kōwhai. We have other trees as well. Um, things that don't block out the light, et cetera, et cetera. And we do need to be mindful of the fact that more than two-thirds 
of our weeds have come from ornamental plants and that every year another 20 uh, exotic introduced plants become naturalised. Some, not all by any means, but some, probably about 25%, will become environmental weeds. So we have to be mindful of that. And so what we can do is, be, is think about place-specific nature when we're doing things. Because when we're doing place-specific nature, we can have multiple outcomes. Besides preventing weed invasion, um, we can hopefully have species that are adapted better to local conditions. Just getting people to think about place means hopefully they're not going to plant a wetland plant on a ridge, for instance. We can enhance biodiversity because we know that that one native plant that you uh, plant has all of these other invertebrates, lichen, fungi, that are going to be associated with it. And as we heard from Rebecca, we can start this process of decolonisation. So it's really clear for uh, indigenous people around the world and urban areas have lost uh, their language and cultural practices associated uh, with particular plant species. Um, and there's a great uh, paper of which Rebecca's an author um, that I uh, suggest you have a look at. Um, so you know, reconnecting uh, people is really important. And if we don't use place-specific nature, what we start doing is going through this extinction of experience negative feedback loop. And wh what that means is people are starting to get disconnected um, with their local environment and with their indigenous biodiversity. And then it's really hard to get them to buy back in to enhancing it and protecting it if they have no emotional connection at all. And, you know, we just heard from Malkin about benefits and we, there is some evidence that higher plant biodiversity can actually give you uh, uh, psychological benefits as well. So it's good to see some of these things being um, brought up in the strategies that we've seen today. Um, we have uh, preference for native species, importantly access for all residents who might well be disconnected completely. And we see this in, in Auckland, disconnected completely uh, from their local environment. Um, and importantly, with some of these action plans, we now can start seeing uh, where people are identifying opportunities to plant. So uh, where there are spaces to plant. Um, and there is still space, and this is something that um, one of our master's students looked at in Auckland um, and modelled occupancy of street trees at only 50% in Auckland. So there were some streets that only were sort of half full of trees, some streets that didn't have any trees at all, and of course that was uh, inequitable. Um, so there's plenty to do. Uh, we're, we're talking about prioritising native species because the balance is so far out in terms of the colonial history. We've got uh, far dominated by exotic uh, species in our street trees, uh, including ones that are banned um, now. Uh, and We've also got monocultures, so not a great idea to plant a gazillion putakawa, which then puts you at risk of disease, which uh, we can now see. There are also opportunities uh, to add biodiversity in. I often say sneak, but I think we need to be more intentional than that, into spaces that already exist to make them multifunctional. So you probably all maybe grew up with playgrounds like this. Low maintenance, mowing, bark, we're sort of moving more towards these playgrounds in Auckland now and marahupara, which are the traditional Māori playgrounds. So you're not just playing, you're connecting, you're getting those physical and mental well-being, uh, and we're getting biodiversity and some carbon as well. And uh, sort of to continue the, the sort of children theme where they're spending eight hours a day at school, um, this is where you want them to be connecting with uh, uh, biodiversity. Um, and they're quite evenly distributed across cities, schools are, and they often have a big footprint. So if we can kind of intentionally start greening our schools as well, um, that's going to be really important for multiple benefits. Uh, so uh, Abby here surveyed 64 primary schools, um, and you can see the extremes of what they had and what they didn't have. Um, not surprisingly, dominated by sports field, dominated by introduced species, 
dominated by Pudakawa, so we're back to this monoculture again of, oh, this works, it grows really well, let's just plant it everywhere. So disease risk. Most lacked that shrub layer, and we can talk about crime prevention, that sort of stuff. Um, the third had environmental weeds. On the positive, more than a third had a little forest patch of some sort, and every school had at least one species that they could be using with whānau for mātauranga Māori learning around uh, weaving. So uh, that's a positive. But there are opportunities here to add greening. And Robin can tell you about the soil and already has, and we need to deal with soil, but also UV. So that particular shade cloth, because I was on the school board of this, was more than $60,000 to prevent UV and skin cancer in kids. Um, when we could spend a lot more money on trees and get multiple uh, benefits here. So a couple more opportunities uh, to finish. I think we, again, need to think about connecting, and I already mentioned that in an answer, so uh, connecting people and places, uh, and there's some good uh, strategies on ecological corridors coming out of Auckland. Two challenges, go into these retailers, you can guess who they are, are they native plants? So you can buy one grisolina, if you like. People are trying to do the right thing, but we can't source plants, at least in Auckland. And I blame the block for everything. This is the winning garden. Um, and it's a not functioning habitat. We've developed, we're developing in people this preference for minimalism. Um, and local suburb, now we have artificial turf everywhere and plastic plants, I've seen. Um, so I love Messi. We need to embrace the Messi.